One for the treble. Two for the bass. Can you get ready? Let's rock this place. Hello everyone, it's CM Kozeman again. And we are back with the... Um, by now, stupefying and... Uh, maddening never-ending task of answering all the questions I received on a previous questions video the link of which you can see in the description below uh, today I'm just at a McChicken menu from McDonald's not a promotion by the way I really like those things and before beginning I would just like to reiterate three main points one Please do not ask any questions in this video. This is an answers video only. Number two, please consider playing this video at 1.75 or two times the speed. Makes me sound like a cooler guy. And number two, three, please consider donating to me on Patreon. I just had a McChicken menu. You know, if you just give me a dollar, I could afford more McChicken menus. I could afford more... Mm. I could afford more Diet Cokes and you know it always feels good to be rewarded for what you like doing okay let's go on with the answers Jin Si Cha asks are you interested in experimenting in other mediums for storytelling I feel a lot of your material would do well in a comic book or graphic novel format um, I am slightly conservative on this uh, manner in this topic because I'm not a good artist for uh, sequential art I can't do graphic novels or comic art like that that skill set is a whole other range of genius which I just don't have so there maybe maybe some of my stories I could tell in sort of you know one sitting completely improvised audiobook campfire narrative kind of uh, attempts but who knows? I mean, just illustrations, paintings, and books. They are the main output venues for me. And Jin Si Cha also asks, a lot of speculative biology focuses too much on animals. Have you tried going down a more botany-focused path? Well, if you support me on Patreon, you could see excerpts from the upcoming Snayat book, which will inevitably have a, sequen uh, have a part dealing with botany and how the so-called plants evolved on that world. So go on, give it a check. Lord Whitehorn asks, what would you be your take on intelligent invertebrates? I mean, uh, why not? Squid are invertebrates and they're very intelligent. Some uh, insect colonies almost work like uh, a civilization in the effects they have on the environment. They uproot soil, they uh, regulate entire plant communities and animal communities. So I believe... There's no obstacle to calling them intelligent. But if you want a sort of like a human-like, you know, one body, one soul type of macro-organismal intelligent being, it would be more like a squid. Maybe like a cross between a giant squid and a seal. Like a giant squid that's semi-terrestrial. So that could work. Also, if the environment was different, something like, a, like with lesser gravity something like a giant insect race is not out, not outside the realms of possibility okay sentient leopard a7 leopard 2a7 so it's an intelligent tank leopard 2 as far as i know is a european tank and you know this nickname alone reminds me go check out the bolo universe b-o-l-o -O. it's this extremely over the top universe of tanks the sizes of giant cities fighting across planets and it's all about intelligent tanks a crazy crazy science fiction universe the bolo universe b-o-l-o -O. anyway sentient leopard 2 a7 asks if there is another concept of living creatures like animals or plants or maybe even bacteria or virus how do you think that they would look or what traits they would possess Another concept of living creatures. Well, this so really sounds like it's been asked by an AI. They, they look like any living creature. Did he mean intelligent? I don't know. So, a moot answer. 
JTCH asks, arachnids? Yeah, arachnids! I'm going to do a video on arachnids in the near future. Stay tuned. Stevan Svenonionus asks, are you planning on making another video that is like your a Neon Genesis Evangelion video? I discussed this on a previous episode. I think it was episode 5 that I toyed with the idea of making a full length, like three hours long Evangelion reinterpretation with angels and a scenario designed all over again but ultimately I didn't do this because it's disrespectful of the original work and plus it would take too much of my time and so I stayed away from it Peter Loomis asks what do you think about you social or colony creatures have you thought about having a project where people deliberately engineer themselves into a lower tech but cooperative colony of different species I don't know, I didn't think about like this in terms of projects, but I always thought about worlds or timelines in which people uh, willingly and deliberately give up certain technologies. I think too much of a good thing is really bad for us, especially when the said technologies are driven by a, an endless and destructive agenda to sell. I mean, currently nothing is stopping us from designing cars that last a century. And uh, but no, everybody has to buy more cars, more cars, more cars. So, and the the situation is the same with computers. I mean, this kind of built-in obsolescence is uh, engineered into many product lines, and I think it's just pure evil. So there, about colony creatures, I've talked a lot about them in previous podcasts. I think colony creatures are legitimately another form of intelligent which roughly show the same effects as people do. They only have uh, less central planning, but they're spectacularly effective. So there. Time Bandits ask, what is, in your opinion, the best work you created over the course of your career? Um, probably it's that one big encyclopedia about the illustrated, uh, illustrated apartment signs of Istanbul. Perhaps not the answer you want to know, but a close second to that will be the Snyad book, I hope. Carlos Cavallos asks, do you think a sci-fi film centered around speculative evolution on another planet would work? If so, how? It would work as a documentary, but like a proper, really nice documentary, like narrated by uh, David Attenborough and all. And also, uh, perhaps something like uh, Disney's Fantasia, you know, that spectacular 1960s, I believe, animation. It was really beautiful, just set to classical music. A weak plot, but really nice uh, really nice storytelling Benjamin Ferreria asks is the Snyat book still in the works yes it's still in the works thank you Kardeshim he says in Turkish thank you uh, go check go check my Patreon for sneak excerpts from Snyat I just posted one the other day and you would really like it if you like Snyat go donate a pound or a dollar Saint Mantis where it asks, where do you begin in world building? Differs, I mean, I haven't done many, many projects. I have illustrated and doodled about many concepts. So sometimes the concepts come first, other times it's just the aesthetics of a certain creature I like, and then I invent the world around them. I mean, years and years ago, that's how Sny at first evolved. I just designed the creatures, and I liked the way they looked. So I designed more and they ended up looking similar. So I ended up creating niches and the world and kind of from the bottom up kind of thing. Saint Mantis asks, are you interested in any other media? I think I kind of answered this. You know, the greatest misgiving I have is not being able to make like proper films with stories. I've, I really look up to those directors films or miniseries I would really have liked to be a director but and it doesn't even need to be a speculative biology or science fiction like something about a real time real life story or like a weird story that, that would be really nice to film so maybe maybe who knows we're not dead yet Yo asks I was going to ask if you were hydrated and when you shake a water bottle just before the video ends, I am in absolute disbelief. Oh, it's like one of those things, I guess. Don't listen to it too much, you'll pee. Here's the question. Yo says, you are hydrated, but are you properly hydrated? How much water do you drink per day? 
you can't fool me, Cosman. You can't get away. Okay. You all need to know. Okay, I'll tell you. Actually, when the COVID pandemic began, uh, you know, we spent, started spending more time indoors. And soon enough, obviously, water and hydration became an issue because normally I would go to an office and, you know, at the office, there's free drinking water for everyone. So I just drink, drink, drink. So, but at home, I conserve resources I, because I conserve money because I'm thrifty like that. And I started drinking less and less and I had headaches during the day. But then uh, my wife and I made like this commitment. So we buy a heck of a lot of water. Oh, by the way, where we live, drink uh, tap water isn't really good to drink. So we buy a heck of a lot of water and I particularly take care to drink like, I don't know, like two to three huge glasses every day and two to three huge glasses every night. And I, I really uh, try to keep, drink as much water as possible in all seasons. Lord of the Yeeting asks, what is your current view on humanity? Do you still have faith in humanity or do you think humanity will and should be extinct? Sorry for the negative question, but the coronavirus COVID pandemic is making me bitter day by day. I don't know, I mean, I answered this question before in a previous podcast. I think it was number one or two of the answers videos. But to shorten the long argument, I think right now humanity is not under threat, but our current civilization is under threat by two forces. One of this is the immeasurable stupidity and arrogance of the ruling classes. They really believe they can manage everything. They really believe that if they make a rule, everyone will obey it and... You know, they really believe that the world is an actionable front, that they need to change it, they need to do things somehow. And this is like baked into educated classes in every country, more so in the developed world. And this is the most dangerous force in the world. I think it's going to lead to a catastrophic uh, synchronization between large companies and state powers and the large companies' desire to sell. And it's also muddling up the values through which we value life and to, through which we measure life. Experiences and individuals do not matter anymore, but basically what matters in every aspect, like if you're talking about health or uh, just pure commerce or just even preservation, people have become hyper fixated on numbers. And if you change numbers, you've done great. But, you know, at what cost? Think about this very carefully because it's a severely dangerous path we're going under. And I mean, everyone, for example, you're in an NGO and you're, I don't know, I'm just making stuff up, but like you're in a global appliance company or something. Okay. And like, how should we design the next appliance so that, you know, we still have shareholder value and we also go green. What they never think about is a universe in which they don't have any appliances. They don't sell any appliances, but people just use the same uh, objects or the same cars or the same appliances as heirlooms for centuries. And some things, you know, people just do without. Why do you need a smartwatch? Why do you need a car? Why do you need a, uh, why do you need a holiday house? Why do you need a different set of clothes every, for every occasion? Why? These questions never get asked. And I, as a result, the, the people who should know better are locked in this interminable stupidity, this cycle of arrogance that they, and blind arrogance. On the other hand, there's this uh, reactionary bloodlust that's building in the, the less fortunate parts of the world. And when, I, when examined, this sounds very upsetting, this sounds very unsettling, things like the Taliban or um, this sounds very savage. Usually it goes hand in hand, violence. But if you examine it, actually, I mean, part of the world, the lucky part, doesn't even regard you as human. What do you do? Of course, you resort to violence. And so between these two forces, our current civilization, the global science, technology-based civilization, is headed towards a very dangerous path. That's my view of humanity. But I think the earth will abide and some form of humanity will certainly abide. But the survivors are not going to come from college-educated stock. They're going to come from some 
uh, yokels and uh, gun-toting peasants in the mountains and they're going to have to rediscover and reinvent and relearn many things again and the world will lay, lie fallow for another century or so. I mean, we will go back to, let's say, 1920s levels of industry and the world will become fragmented again. A dramatic reduction in the world's population is not impossible, but unlikely. And then from there we will rebuild, hopefully. <clears throat> Greg Pham asks, I would love to know more about your background from Turkey and back. How you ended up collaborating on all yesterdays? Are you still in touch with John and Darren? Wishing you great health and happiness from Singapore. Thank you, man. I was born and raised in Turkey. I did my master studies in London. And even before then, I was in contact with John and Darren because they were my uh, internet idols, so to speak. I actually filmed a documentary about Darren and his Tetrapod Zoology blog. And it's on this channel if you go way, way back. I was online friends with them. And when I was doing my master's in London in between the years 2007 and 2009... I was really good friends with them. I hung out with uh, John Conway especially for like in many occasions and together we had the idea of making all tomorrow, all yesterday's the book and the rest. We are still friends but of course John and Darren both have their own projects and I have my own life and obviously we can't meet each other as often. I mean the last I saw them was in 2018 I believe. We were at this uh, big uh, London uh, paleo event where Brian Ford and Darren Nash had a debate about the ridiculous old dinosaurs were aquatic theory, too big to walk or something like that. And it was a really nice time. And I still miss that those days. So my best regards to Singapore. Big Mac Savage asks, how did you get started in paleo art? And what would you tell people who want to venture into that field? There's a video on my channel about questions from a paleo art hopeful. Go watch that video. It contains all the answers and more. And he asks, Big Mac Savage asks, by the way, do you know Joshua Knup? Yes, I really know, love his work. He's a great, extremely talented genius of an artist. Very prolific. And he's someone I look up to in terms of artwork and overall productivity. Okay, Otako Illuminati asks, Hi Kozuman, I read all the stuff of Snayad you made until now, and in some part of the timeline you talked about six-limbed and eight-limbed creatures and flying creatures. And he asks, will you be talking about these in the upcoming Snayad book? The answer is yes. Follow me on Patreon if you want to find out more. Mysterious Worlds asks, When did you first become interested in speculative evolution and how... I was first interested in strange creatures of all sorts. As a child, I had this, I don't know, maybe reflexive fixation on anything that was not a human and just a weird creature or a robot. Like from a childhood onwards, I, I drew this kind of characters. It was somehow baked into my personality. And of course, as I grew older, uh, I started to pursue these things, first in the world of mythology, then in pop culture, then in paleontology and biology and zoology. And through that, I became interested, interested in speculative evolution. It was the inimitable great book by Wayne Barlow, Expedition. You know, it first got me hooked in speculative evolution. Epic asks, how to design Westmint for a culture? Great question. In some of my works, including Old, old Tomorrows, there are characters with clothes on them. I mean, I wish I could say I did some heavy research for these co costumes, but I just improvised them on the drawings on, on spot. Usually, I mean, it all starts with two things. What materials are available to these people? So if they are uh, an underwater species, you know, maybe they cannot weave as properly as we do. Or maybe they do, I don't know. Uh, or what other materials, like like plant fibers, or uh, like if, if, there's, if these aliens are living in a kind of fire planet, I don't know, like, or if it's like uh, a really hot, circuit, hot temperature, maybe, you know, fibers themselves may not be practical. Or they might, I don't know, depends on the chemistry. So see what materials are available to them first and then, you know, try to imagine the occasions they would be used in 
And if these are like human type sophons or, or just practically any animal with a social structure, that is to say any animal with a social hierarchy, maybe even lobsters. <laughs> Anyways, uh, try to never forget that these, if they have a social hierarchy, these beings will invent clothes to make themselves look fancier and fleshier than their kin. And, you know, this is also a point to consider. Other than that, just improvise. I mean, improvisation is a n n not negligible force. It's not a negligible force. Lugia Gaurdian asks, how did you get into speculative zoology? I answered this before. Thank you. Starley Chapsin asks, what is your favorite color? It's tangerine, yellow. Louis J asks, if we send you our own speculative evolution projects, will you look at them? Well, you can send them and you can find my contact lists if you go to my website. You can find my contact details. But I receive so much email these days and I receive so many comments that please don't be mad if I cannot get back to you. You know, if I don't respond, please know that I enjoyed it. So there, you know, my time is finite. Jason S. asks, do you have any new projects you're working on? Uh, yes, Nayad is one, but uh, other than that, I don't like to reveal my future projects because I'm afraid of jinxing them. Uh, T. French asks, how do you motivate yourself? And uh, Algeria Windows asks, do you get art block? If yes, how do you counter it? Okay, first, before everything, I need to say thank you to my friend Algeria Windows. Because this person has been patiently watching all these videos, you know, and commenting below them. You didn't, he didn't answer my question again. Still, I will wait for the next part. It's very solemn, you know, very touching, very poetic. And thank you so much, Algeria Windows. I imagine always these, like, scenarios in which, imagine, like, this kind of... Uh, kind of this fictional environment where it's like the Sahara Desert meets, the, meets an endless ocean, okay? It's a kind of like uh, mysterious uh, oriental Middle Eastern setting like and these people are what there's the ocean, there's the endless desert and there's the infinite beach and at the edge of the beach there's a colossus of CM Kozaman but it's been it's made out of like time resistant glass or crystal but it's been so long that the, this statue's face has eroded you know it's been billions of years and out of this desert comes this mystical monastic order of Algeria windows they look to the statue and they say he hasn't answered again and the other priest says Yet we will be patient. We will keep ask waiting. Sooner or later, our question will be answered. And then the wind is howling around the time-worn colossus, you know. And this has been going on for thousands of years. Yet from the statue, there is no response. But now, fear not, because I am going to answer your question. These two questions are one. Of course, I get art block, but um, the trick is, I think, to have a have a day job that also takes a, takes up some of your time, so that when something is uh, quote unquote eating into your time, you realize how valuable time is, and you just scramble to work. And I mean, it takes a bit of self discipline. I mentioned before that not using a smartphone or just dedicating yourself to a single task really helps. And uh, through these methods you can counter art block. Maver Rick asks, I was playing a game with zombies. How would the animals adapt to the threat of a zombie virus or their disease? I think, okay, I, I mean, thank you for this question, Maver Rick, but personally, I really dislike the whole zombie scenario, the zombie thing. I mean, World War Z, the book, it's nicely written, but if you read it, you kind of get the sense that someone's pulling you a fast one, like you're being cheated. 
I really don't get this whole deal with zombies, like they're supposed to be a slow but unstoppable force. But if something like that existed, it would be easily dealt with. I mean, just uh, get 10 guys with assault rifles and ta 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 ta, -ta it's over. Uh, the real danger, I think, two guys with knives out to kill you or a, a gang of people out to lynch you is a far more uh, deadly and unforgiving threat than compared to zombies. And you know, something like that has existed on this planet. It's called humanity. It's called a hunter, a band of hunters. They're far worse than a zombie can ever be because they're smart, they're relentless, they're, there's a, a very large number of them. And I think animals would adapt just as they had adapted to us. In fact, if humans were replaced by these zombies instantly, I think animals would rebound like this, you know. Jose Leon asks, who is the best girl in Konosuba? Okay, I'll need to Google this. I never watched Konosuba. Let's see, Konosuba. Okay. Hmm. Images. Oh my God. Wow. Okay. These are just kids. Okay, this is disturbing. I'm 37. How old are these characters? If I was the same age as these characters, I think I would get along with the blue-haired girl the best. But I don't like these harem settings in animes. I don't know if Konosuba is a harem anime. What the hell is going? What's the plot here? Let me read it just a second. La 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 la. God's blessing on this one is a Japanese... Uh, it's about a dysfunctional ass. Ah, so it's like this, a fantasy role-playing party, but the characters are not the goddess or the wizard or the crusader, but they're like this dysfunctional school children types. And I don't know, I like the blue-haired girl, but I'll leave it there. Yuraj Hunt asks, how did you get on the BBC one time? And do you think you could work with them again? I would love to work with BBC. It was a great show about alien worlds. The, the production company, they were really helpful, really great. They took care of everything. And, you know, from here, uh, if you ever want to work with me again, I would be happy. They just emailed me one day and, and it happened. I don't know. Beyond that, I cannot really tell. I think if you keep at a certain thing long enough and if you kind of build up a reputation from it, these kind of opportunities come out and find you somehow. Have any other major TV companies contacted you? Not that I can tell of. Jose Leon asks, is there a program you recommend for beginners to draw creatures? Yes, this program is called Paper and pen, really, nothing else. Just draw with your hands. In fact, I still, I'm not very good at uh, drawing on a computer. I draw on a paper and then take this up on computer and digitally manipulate it and have this kind of seamless integration. So the best program is patience and just a piece of paper. Just draw. Richard Lambert asks, do you think religion will ever truly die or do you think it will just evolve with us? I think... Okay, so in the beginning of the 2000s, you know, the entire world was united in celebration to celebrate the birth of internet atheism. And in, 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 the, in the early 2000s, like until 2013 or something, the internet atheist with his neck beard and fedora ran supreme. And, you know, it was commonly everyone believed that uh, the internet would result in fair access to knowledge and everybody would just suddenly understand how evolution works and how, and they would reject all these dirty no good uh, peasants who were religious i'm being sarcastic here and all those conservative religious people those horrible horrible people will be consigned to the trash heap of history at least that was the accepted wisdom back then but then, of course, religion never truly dies. The more stupid forms of uh, religious extremism, the kind we see in, in the US or other countries, you know, they did uh, take many steps back uh, compared to what the Internet has been able to provide. And the Internet has been a great tool, uh, a, a great virtue to combat the spread of these brainwashing cults, these fanatic cults, you know, people 
have access to way more opinions. They have an out. They can reach other people. So that on the whole has been a, an undeniable good. But uh, unlike these neckbeards predicted, religion never dies out because uh, death will never be uh, defeated. Contrary to what some of those transhumanist types might tell you, there will always be death, there will always be tragedy. Heck, there will always be uncertainty. You saw this with the COVID crisis. What's going to happen tomorrow? We're going to enter uh, uh, two more decades at least in which the future will be very, 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 very uncertain. Now, in these settings, you know, emotionally, spiritually, it pays to believe that, you know, it's not in my control. And uh, people will somehow concede this and through that religion of some sort will keep on existing i mean so the religious extremism of the sort you were used to in the sort of like the uh, mega church extremism of the 1980s of the reagan and the early george bush years that will die out or you know the sorts of extremism you see in other religions the more brute form of, like, the more brutal, uh, clunky sort of religious extremism will die out. But there will always be other forms of religion, and there will still be other forms of religious extremism. It will manifest itself in completely other forms, maybe as a, as a way to distinguish settled populations from uh, migrants or outsiders, or just as a kind of emotional leverage against an invading force, you know. So, I think, and this is a case of religion evolving right there. I mean, I mean, I know people from uh, many religions right now, they say uh, still God exists, but evolution is the way through which he works. And how do you combat that now, huh? So there. You'll have a stroke after reading this, asks, uh, sorry. Favorite order of animals, and why is it Cetartilodactyla? It's the clade combining whales and artiodactyls, isn't it? Even toad ungulates. Yes, yes, I really like those. Pigs, buffalo, giraffes, deer, whales. Just an amazing group. I mean, just on the sheer, uh, sheer awesomeness aspect of having whales in there, you know, I think at least, if nothing else, it's the best mammal order perhaps except for bats but no no best mammals are the setartiodactyls you have me sold magnus organas how are you i'm great man thank you i'm loving your comments right now yurach hunt asks an all tomorrow's question and is sadly rejected i good asks where did your ideas of evolution come from uh I just uh, read a lot of science books and my ideas about evolution evolved. Orson Z asks, are you going to continue Snyat? I am continuing Snyat. Go on patreon.com slash cmcosman. National Posadist asks, will you start, when will you start working on All Todays? All Todays was a section in All Yesterdays and it, I've already worked on it, so there. Papercut7 asks, what are the most and least fun parts of world building? I can see nothing that's not fun about it. So there, world building itself is the most fun part of itself. And he asks, are you going to do more videos like the Natural History of Evangelion? Have a good one. Thanks, Papercut. I answered this question before. Orlando Garcia asks, what would probably be the next breeding dog that ends up with a lot of problems like the pug head? the German Shepherd Hips, and what features will probably be bred on future dogs. I think future dogs and cats and all pets will be bred to have bigger eyes, to have more human-like faces, and to have more uh, even temperaments. But I also see like a lot of problems coming up with... They are breeding these hyper-vicious uh, pit bull type of dogs, sometimes with like extra layers of muscles and shit. So I think those are going to have a lot of problems. Primarily concerned with their behavior, because it's like a vicious, like it's, not, it's like a para-predator, it's something like a beyond the predator, an animal that's bred only for killing's sake, not even eating. So those are going to have and those are going to become a lot of problems. 
if you catch my gist. Medusa Lark asks, what do you think about the biology of Pandora from James Cameron's Avatar? How creative and realistic do you think it is? In today's Hollywood con uh, conditions, I think it's the best speculative uh, environment that's been uh, consigned to the big screen ever. I mean, there's a bit of a uh, distasteful uh, side of it. You know, the Navi look extremely human, while everything else on the planet is a hexapod. But you know, hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta let that one slip. I think you can't have a hundred million dollar franchise without at least conceding some normie points like that. So yeah, what is the climate of climate and gravity of Snayad? Asks Juan Lu. It, gravity is either slightly higher or slightly lower than that of Earth, and the climate is slightly more stable than the world's I mean the the ecliptic tilt is lesser so it's a more even uh, climate climate is kind of like a cross between the Mediterranean world and the Balkans but also there are some jungle and desert environments too so yeah Nathan Mock asks I've been a messing fan I've been a massive fan of your works thanks man asks another side question I answered this before what techniques do you recommend for starting out in art? I answered this before, just draw. And number three, how do you stay motivated to complete research? I answered this before, have a single track working schedule. Don't use a smartphone and do one thing per day, but do it. Strength asks, how did you get into art and science? I answered this question before, thanks. Uh, 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 uh. The Flying Mantis asks, oh, it's this question. Have you ever considered making a joke series called All Man Days, where an entire species of the titular Monday-hating cat Garfield is let loose on a planet to evolve to fill all available niches? Okay, thank you for this question, but no disrespect, but Garfield may be one of the... I'm not even saying comics, I'm not even saying art... Or, it may be one of the forms of cultural exp expression that I really loathe, I hate the most. It's cheap, it's banal, it revels in, it's reveling in being banal. It's, if you know the expression, it's saltless, tasteless, stale. It looks like it might be Xerox, the jokes are all flat, and they were flat even when it first came out. There was a spin-off cartoon called Garfield and Friends that was slightly better. But, I mean, that whole, that whole attitude, you know, the kind of the nonchalant, jaded, cynical character expressing himself or her, herself through dislikes and inaction. It's one of the worst evils with the modern world today. Remember how I, sp how I spoke about the infinite arrogance of the educated ruling classes in the present day and age? Garfield is like uh, another manifestation of that evil. So is France, by the way. Like these characters who are out there to do a job, the world owes them a living, and they just exist through their dislikes and uh, their cynicism. I just hate it. I mean, if, if something, if, if any book should be burned, this should be it. I mean, so there. Fiasco Gabe asks, if you had the opportunity to make another all your yesterdays, would you? The first one was a great opportunity to bring the Paleo Art community together. Thank you. If I had more time, I would probably do like twice as many, uh, twice as many images for all yesterdays. In fact, maybe I could do, even extend it, like, I mean, I would have fossil, uh, like they drag up these uh, shells of wrecked cars or automobiles from the bottom of a lake or something and they they imagine these are creatures but how would you flesh out a, a car is it something like an armadillo you know what fills out the driver's compartment is it full of flesh you know e even with those weird things i would uh, try to integrate into it maybe i'll make such a drawing i don't know Atramia, Atramia asks have any specific authors or artists inspired your projects my chief inspiration was Wayne Barlow, followed by H.R. Giger. But if you go to cm.cosman.com and go to the inspiration site, you can see a lot of things that inspire me. 
Brandrich Omnipotrix asks, what kinds of alien life will look like in the soul system even if they are multicellular and complex? If there is extraterrestrial life in the world of the soul system, which one of them has potential to evolve into an intelligent alien species? I think maybe the answer to this question would be found in the moon of Jupiter, Europa. It's an ice world with an ocean beneath it, and probably there are some living creatures under them. I mean, as for what they look like, they probably look like, uh, I would say, the shadows of uh, organisms that we have on the world's oceans. That is to say, they would be aquatic creatures, but their arrangement of their organs and their biochemistry would be different and unique. And, you know, maybe there could be something like a semi-intelligent giant squid alien in Europa. Who knows? Nathan Francis asks, in your slide, will you go into detail about the human colonies? Your casual mention of a sublime elite really stroked my curiosity the first time I read it. Yes, I spoke about these elites in the previous video, the Answers Part 6 video, so go check that out. National Posadist asks, have you ever worked on a conlang? That's a great question. Yes, but no. Okay, so for the past month... I have been working on SNIAD, I have been working on the scientific nomenclature of SNIAD. And you know, in our world the names given are mostly from Greek or Latin root, and you know, some more recent discoveries have more native names. So I asked to myself, this is not really a conglang, but comes as close to a conglang as I can probably get. So I asked this scientists on SNIAD, they would uh, maybe create a, a pool of words from extinct uh, earth languages. I'm talking about extremely uh, little known Anatolian archaic languages. Actually, let me just a second. Drive. Wait a minute. So they populate the, the root words for their scientific names. The Greek and uh, Latin roots are there, but it's complemented by a, a sheaf of an entire uh, selection of other words from other roots. And these, were, these languages are languages such as Thracian or Arabic or Proto-Indo-European, Hurrian, uh, Pisidian, Karian, Malagasy language, uh, Hittite language, Toharian language, Ancient Macedonian language, Cappadocian Greek. So, for example, um, let's say we have an animal that somewhat resembles a goat, but also resembles a, a lizard. Now, this animal could be named Attagon Savros, because Attagon means goat or goat-like animal in Phrygian. That's an extinct Anatolian language. Or, or more things like, um, for example, just a second... Let me find a cool word. By the way, if you want to see this entire list, you have to subscribe to me on Patreon. It's out there. And you can see all the cool words I've been adding to it. In Etruscan, the ancient language of the Romans, Kaluzna means the underworld or the netherworld. So imagine a imagine a like big-eyed, creepy-looking nocturnal predator from Snyat that lives in these gallery forests or these pinnacle ranges. That could be named Kaluzna Venator. So it is cool names. I'm really having a good time creating these word lists and coming up with these names. Sometimes even uh, the names dictate the way the animals look in my head. Um, there's this magic of language for you. So... For example, Izar means whale in Arabic, okay? Um, so if you have something like um, Kitrinizaros, which means Kitrinos means green in Greek, and Izaros is from Izar, so something like a green whale. You know, what does this conjure? Some animal with a green, huge whale-like crest. Maybe it starts from the bottom of its neck, but it envelops all of its body. It surrounds its second head 
and it's this kind of gracile, green veiled, um, this kind of curious uh, cryptic animal. So, all these, I mean, going through these um, words helps me conjure up all these visions of creatures and it's just so much fun and if you subscribe to me on patreon you can see this list i'm just going to post it today so there just a second just a second okay where were we shizu wolf holajima asks have you heard of the game biomutant have you why do you think every form of animal in that game has fur? I don't know. I'm not much of a gamer, guys and girls. Biomutant. Let's Google it. Oh, it's kind of this like bizarre furry crossed over with uh, strange game. It's just a game. It's It's got really cool and consistent design and I like it. I never played it. I probably never will, but it's a great game. And, you know, this is a stylistic choice. There's not much science to question it. So there. How will things evolve in the biomutant world? They will keep remaining furry for as far as I can see. Ram comments. I love your work. Thank you. How do you gain inspiration to imagine and piece together such an intricately different stories and forms of humans and animals? And how long did it take to draw them the way you wanted? I mean, for my drawing process, you could go visit that uh, art tutorials I have on this channel. And the other part about how I'm inspired and what inspires me, I've answered it multiple times on these, this series of videos. So, so yeah. Gia Fonte Maggi asks, I forgot. You forgot? Scusi, cazzo, man. I'm sorry. Icaro Villarim asks, do you have any tips for new authors who want to dip into weird speculative fiction evolution? Just a second. Selam, abi. My uh, co-worker is here. Today I'm working from another office setting. So my co-worker just arrived. So in a bit, we should call it a day. But no. Oh. We're almost done with the questions. Oh, no, far from it. Okay, so last three questions. Okay. That, 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 that. Any authors want to dip into weird speculative evolution? I mean, I answered this question before, but here's something I can say. Determine one thing from the outset. Do you want a story? Do you want to create a world? If you want to build lore, just go with the lore option. If you want to create a story... Design the story first. Don't even think about the world. The world will design itself as you write the story. Pick one of those and then just write. If you're writing a story, it helps to know the ending or sometimes these projects can languish. And, you know, when you're writing, don't use the internet and you'll discover that you'll write way, way fast, faster. William asks, what's your favorite animal? I answered this before, I really like flies, but today I'll say spiders. Spiders are amazing, they're cool. Especially jumping spiders. And all, especially those like weird orders with only a few species, like they look like these flat, black, uh, shiny things. They, they are great spiders. Uh, 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 final question. Elron Hoyabembe asks, in your interview with Alt X, you mentioned the growing popularity of wikis such as the SCP Foundation and Warhammer 40k. What kind of potential do you think this format has in the future of art, literature, and even academic academia in this new age of the internet? I think there's great format for this. And, you know, sooner or later, somebody's, some of the big publishers, like the people who publish Harry Potter, for example, they're just going to go like full road dog with the... Uh, with the world building uh, aspect of their stories and even harry potter as much as i dislike that franchise you know it, they did go that way you know they had this guide to imaginary beings kind of installment in their series and lo and behold it was made into a movie a remarkably crap one but nevertheless so i mean in the future we might see more franchises that are primarily centered on the world building and the stories are just like these really lucrative but comparatively small side branches from the main body of their work. So there everyone, this has uh, been another part 
I really hoped we could finish it today, but it looks like we can't, so there's going to be yet another part. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, like, and comment, but don't ask any questions under this video, and please consider supporting me on Patreon. Have a nice day, and goodbye.